Hey guys, Gunstar here, and this is the 2015 Too Many Games Wrap Up Pickups All the Ups video. Um, but before we get into it, I just want to make say that uh, if you head over to the Segments YouTube channel, my new episode of Hit Reset is on there finally. Um, it is about the weird, obscure Sega produced platformer Wild Woody, which um, it's something. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff in it. It's probably one of the best videos I'm like most proud of that I've made, and uh, a lot of unique content that I can say is just you know different from what I usually do, and different from pretty much anything I've ever seen. Um, uh, there's stuff from the composer, from the original voice actor, from people who worked on the game, like all kinds of stuff. So uh, if you're interested in the history of a really obscure game that almost nobody cares about, I'm here for you. Um, but anyways, so too many games happened over the weekend, and uh, as usual, the convention was one of the most fun that I've ever been to. Um, besides MAGFest, this is probably the convention I look forward to every year, although I'm still very East Coast-centric. Uh, this will be the first year I end up out at Texas and West Coast stuff, so maybe you guys will prove me wrong. Maybe maybe the East Coast just ain't down with video game conventions yet, but... Uh, the marketplace again this year was fantastic. Um, it, it continues to be better than Magfest. It has a little bit bigger reach um, and tends to be a lot more focused on video game vendors and resellers and stuff as opposed to being more oriented towards the uh, memorabilia, like uh, apparel, uh, artist alley style vendors, um, which is not a bad thing by any means. I'd actually rather have two different ones where I can get kind of a different feel, but. Um, I do look forward a little bit more to hunting for retro games, so, you know, I have a little bit of a bias on that. But, uh, a lot of the time was spent this year on the show floor by yours truly because, uh, I was working with the 8-Bit Evolution booth that I now currently work at, and, uh, I had a lot of fun there, and I actually got to meet quite a few people there. Um, Linkara, Takahata, um, Two Best Friends Play, GameSack all came by the booth, and a lot of them left with stuff, um, which was really cool, and I got to just talk like video games with them, which was fun, and a lot of other people, too, that aren't famous names, but, yeah, I got a little braggy, what can I say? <laughs> um, but not only that, I also got to see a lot of old friends, the Sprite Lovers, Mr. Fantastic, uh, Grimsy42, and then the, uh, non-YouTube guys like the Late Brothers and my friend Pat and Sean Milligan and Pete and all those guys. It was nice to see some hometown people now that I don't see them very often, so that was, that was nice. Um, I also did two panels, um, both of which were very, very enjoyable for me for different reasons. Um, the first one was actually the first panel of the entire weekend at the convention, and uh, unfortunately, due to the long line to get into the convention, um, we didn't have as many people as I think we could have had that not been the case, but uh, myself and two good friends of mine, uh, Joe Drilling and uh, Eric Gear. Oh my god, I'm gonna mispronounce Eric's name now, and I'm gonna feel really bad. Anyways, um, we did a panel on 16-bit games that have the same name, but are totally different games. Um, which was a great panel, and I, I've done it once, uh, once or twice before at smaller conventions. This is the biggest convention I've done it at, and uh, I enlisted their help to do it because they both have shows with concepts similar to that. Uh, Joe has his show on his On The Stick YouTube channel uh, called Same Name, Different Game, which... And uh, Eric has his show on Graydor, Grydor, however he pronounces it. There'll be links for both of them down at the bottom. Um, game versus game, which both have the same concept. Um, and we showed off each three games a piece that do exactly what they say. And, you know, it was really fun just to show off the games, kind of, you know, informative. But we also had a little bit of, you know, people were getting into it. And, you know, for the people that came, we were very thankful for it. And, uh, it was just a good time for us. It's been fun planning it out and, you know, getting to meet these guys and kind of becoming friends and, you know, hopefully if we ever meet cross paths at the same convention again, I'd do, we, you know, we all do it in a heartbeat, so we can always improve from what we learned this time. The other panel was the uh, Sega Bits panel, which was where Wild Woody debuted to a full house. The panel was actually closed off. They actually had to close the doors, which, uh, you know, it's a small room. I turn off the phone and vibrate. Um, but I was very, very pleased just to have, like, a lot of people in there, and the reception was actually really good, so that made me feel better because I was really worried it was going to be too cheesy. But you can find out for yourself if it is. Last plug. Um, but I also got to do a couple other panels. Um, the guys from My Life in Gaming, uh, which is Corey and I'm going to forget his other name. Oh, that makes you feel bad. Um, but both of them did a panel on RGB modding for classic consoles, which is basically a way to get better picture out of your older systems for, you know, higher end TVs and for stuff like me for video capture and everything. And it was a great panel, learned some stuff, and uh, definitely something I'm going to be trying to do soon so that, you know, my video footage looks nicer. 
Um, I also got to go to the GameSec Q&A panel. It was, like, the only one I was, like, super gung-ho. Like, I was, like, had to go to it, and I did manage to get into that. That one also got closed off, and uh, that was fun, too. They teased a few new episodes that I'm looking forward to and other stuff like that, and uh, it was nice to go meet them as well. But uh, most of my time was spent either on the show floor selling things or hanging out with my friends or just hanging out with April going searching for video games, which is where the pickups part starts, and that's where we are now. So what did we get? Well... A potpourri of things would be the best way. So I'm gonna start with the board games. Now, um, there's a place in New Jersey called Tiki Tiki Board Games where I got one of these board games. I got a couple other ones, but they're not video game related, so I'm just gonna leave them off this video. But one that people don't know actually happened. A lot of people know about like the retro 90s board games, which I have a couple of them about to show. But actually, there was one as far back as like 2006, 2000, what, 2007, which is Big Brain Academy had a board game, and it's actually it, it's really faithful actually like there's a set of cards and there's like a weight actually like I'll show it really quick just because I want to open it up and show off but uh there's actually like a weight that you plug in and you would just put you get chips for all the questions you'd have like 30 seconds and you and a partner would try to like get as many of the questions right just like you do in the game and then you would get these chips and at the end of the game when everyone's done five rounds you would put all the chips into one bucket and the two teams would compare and whoever had the bigger brain weight was the winner so I mean like it's kind of cheesy and it's more like kind of educationally, but like for being faithful, totally. Um, and I, as a board game collector, I think it's kind of cool and I love getting all the video game board games, so you know, I had to have it. And there's a lot of video game board games, actually. There's a lot more besides the ones that you know. Quite possibly, like this one that I picked up for very cheap from my friends at Lucky Cat, who I continue to go to at every convention they're at. They are one of the best import shops I've ever dealt with, besides like Warp Zone, who I didn't show any of the stuff off that I got from him back at another convention, but whatever. Um, and Penn Hill, my local import shop. But um, they randomly brought the Legend of Zelda board game, which is one of the very few Milton Bradley board games I don't have yet that were based on video games. I have Mario, I have Sonic, I have Zaxxon, but I'm still missing a couple. I have Pac-Man, but um, the box is beat to crap, and it's missing a couple of the heart tokens that went with it, but uh, it has everything else. It does have this tiny little Zelda thing, and it has this terrifying faced Pole's voice, among other things, but uh, this is one of the more unique of the Milton Bradley board games. Um, we, like I, said, I actually played the Sonic one. I brought it to the Second Bits panel, and it's awful. And I kind of regret it. Not really. I love it, but it's bad. It's not a board game you ever really want to play. Uh, Zelda actually has some unique attributes to make it a little more interesting, but it's still kind of wonky, and I'm not a big fan of the style, but it's got cool art. It's displayable, so that's great. Uh, but I also picked up another pan um, another booth, which I forget who it was, the really big Street Fighter 2 board game, which is arguably worse than Legend of Zelda, because, like, it's kind of cool, because you have, like, all these, like, 3D buildings that go on this big board, but really all these are, like, your stat trackers, they're just on the board, and there's this big board, I'll close up to show, there's this big board roadway area, and all you do is basically, like, slide around, like, every turn you roll, if you're playing with a lot of people, you can see, like, right here, all you do is, like, move, like, from roadway to roadway, you knock into that person, and you battle each other by rolling three die and end up a total. And eventually, whoever gets the high, like, gets their power level all the way to here, decides to be stupid and go fight Bison in his, like, little dungeon tower, wins the game. It's really, really, really simplistic, and it is totally one of those board games they sold on being like, look, it's 3D, and it's in a giant box, and it's it's cool, and it's, it's not. It's not a good board game. Um, there are very few video game-based board games that I actually have found so far that are actually good. The uh, only one I'll argue is for Roller Coaster Tycoon. But anyway, so those are the board games that I got. But those those are like random little things. Um, so the Sprite Lovers came, and uh, I happened to find a game that Nate was looking for really hard. It was an Atlas published fishing game for the Xbox, and uh, I bought it for him for like it was like four bucks, and he was super happy. And what I had forgotten was he actually had a five dollar game he had picked up for me way back when that we ended up swapping, basically calling it Even Stevens, which is um, the Virtual Fighter animation fighting game for the Game Gear, which um, is based on the Virtual Fighter OVA or whatever happened in Japan. And uh, I fully expect this to suck because it looks like Virtua Fighter 2 for the Genesis, which is a 2D fighting game and with poor controls. But uh, I've heard it's very f goofy and weird as far as like having cutscenes and everything. So uh, it's a complete inbox Game Gear game. 
I ain't gonna complain for five bucks for anything at this point. So, you know, that was kind of cool to get. Um, he also gave me a free gift of a really nicely still packaged uh, cleaning kit, like a third party one. Um, everything's still in there, which is kind of nice. It, uh, or, yeah, it has a free Game Gear cleaner, so, like, you know, it's still got this part, and it's, like, got both cleaners. It's a little bit dinged up, but, like, you know, it's weird. It's wonky and it was free. I'm not going to complain. Um, so, day one, um, I didn't do a lot of damage on day one, actually. Day one was kind of slow, um, but day one was also where I got probably the best pickup I got of the weekend, um, which was... Double Dragon for the Sega Genesis, um, but the price tag was only 30 bucks, which normally you kind of, well, the best way to do it is if you buy as soon as the con opens or you buy at the end, because you're either going to get negotiate down deals when they don't want to take all the stuff back as somebody who works at a booth when it's a lot of shit. It takes a long time to like pack up and everything and it's a pain in the ass. So the less stuff you take back, the better. Um, or you buy immediately because they're slipping on a price or because like it's something that's like is super sought after and you just don't have a good instinct and this is one of those cases where it's like that the reason I think it was 30 because it's usually like a $60 game is that if you open it up this is all you see so theoretically you're going to assume that this has nothing else in it but if you pop when I uh, took a look at it I popped the cartridge if I can do it quickly and lo and behold, there's something behind it. You pop it open, and not only is the registration card in there, but so is the manual. Actually, there's two registration cards. Um, which, not only that, so that's already, like, a good deal. Um, this is actually a, like, greatest hits-like version, like, a weird, like, variant re-release that they did. This one's actually worth even more than, like, a regular complete box one. Not by a shit ton, but a little bit. So, like, this was, like, a super, like, pickup and I did want it I actually like Double Dragon quite a bit and I've always wanted to play the arcade version and uh, Arena just recently played this on Game Center CX so technically it's now part of the Game Center CX collection so that was like a double whammy for me so that was exciting um, speaking of the Arena collection I also picked up a really nice copy of Shinrin the Wanderer Mystery Dungeon 2 for the Super Famicom now there are English versions of this game released in America for the DS and I believe the Wii also had it but I don't know if it's the like actual like version that was on here. I know the DS is like a full like just remake of it, but uh, this is a great game. If you play Pokemon Mystery Dungeon or any kind of like dungeon crawly roguelike game on Steam, like it's very similar to that, but you know, very, very nice, very well kept game. You know, it's part it's part of the Arena collection since I wanted the original and it was cheap. Um, that was from Windy City Gaming, who was another really good import store. If you don't notice, I go to a lot of import stores because I like imports. Um, so, got a good deal on that. Unfortunately, Windy City didn't have a lot. Like, I actually bought a decent amount from them last year, but this year just didn't have as much as I usually get from them. So, that kind of stuff happens. You know how it goes. Um, and then, I think that was it for... Oh! Well, no. There was two more things. Um, I had asked earlier, I have a friend, um, back home, uh, Forgotten Freshness. Uh, Frank owns it, um, and he had been out and kind of, like, said what he, uh, like, I had mentioned how I had too many games last year. They had C-Man, complete in box, like, with the cardboard and the microphone and everything. And I passed it up, and it was, like, a good price, and I'm, like, I'm kicking myself for it. And another time I'd gone to the store, he had a Samba de Amigo with the maracas, and I'm, like, I'm kicking myself for that. And he's, like, well, I actually got both of them back in stock. You want me to bring it? And I'm, like, yeah, bring them. So I finally have C-Man in the box, in, the, in like the box box, um, with the, uh, if I can get it out, games here, um, the mic adapter piece, and also the harder to get, if it comes out, um, green colored microphone, which I don't know really much difference. I was just told that the green microphones the is, is not as easy to come by, um, which is, you know, Shows how uneducated my butt is. But, uh, yeah, so I haven't even booted up C-Man yet, really, besides, like, a quick, like, make sure it works thing. Not that I don't trust Frank. Frank's actually, like, one of the best when it comes to, like, conditional stuff. So, you know, you may be praying relatively market price, but he, you know, you're gonna get, like, minty stuff. Um, also, I found out recently Samba de Amigo did not have a double pack. You basically had to buy the Maraca separate no matter what. There was no, like, packed version as far as I'm to be aware of. Um, found that out today or this weekend, so that was cool. But Samba de Amigo, pick that up. And of course, finally, a US set of the Maracas. And they work, because I played this game for like three hours. <laughs> but uh, very happy to finally have, like one of the very few music rhythm games that I didn't have. And you know, the Maracas are still 
very happy. The game's a little little sensitive for the times, but uh, you know, generally speaking, impressive. It does work pretty well. It's like 95% of the time I feel like any mistakes I made are my own and the game reads them all correctly, but uh, generally speaking, um, I like the game a lot. Um, now, April, who is not, who kind of decided she, she's camera shy. She was cool with that. But I wanted to show off some of her stuff really quick because it's cool stuff that we both have to share. Um, she's not, I don't know if she's opening this yet or not, but my boss was nice enough to help us obtain a still sealed slime controller that Hori published, um, I think for Dragon Quest VIII's release. Um, if you can't, it, you can't really see it without like angling it, but like it shows you kind of on here on the bottom. The, his butt, like his bottom is where the controller is held. And this is not really a controller you use. This is a display piece, basically. You could play like a turn-based game with this, but that's about all you're gonna get out of him. But uh, he's super, it, it, she's a Dragon Quest nerd, like super hardcore, so like finding this was like something she's been dying to get for quite a while. And uh, I'm glad she got it. But finally, um, the other thing I got from Lucky Cat when I bought the Legend of Zelda board game was only five bucks, and I bought it specifically because, again, Game Center CX Arena Collection was Quiz My Quiz Dreams. I, I forget the full title. This is the Capcom Dating Sim Quiz Game Hybrid, which completely unknown in America. I'm never able to play it, but it was five bucks. But you might know it for this character right here. This is Saki. Um, she was the gun-toting, laser-beaming chick from Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. Uh, this is the game she was in. It's also on the PlayStation 1. Um, it's supposed to be one of the best quiz games, like, ever made. And, I mean, given that Capcom also made Quiz and Dragons, I'm inclined to believe them. But, unfortunately for me, until somebody decides to do a translation of this, if it hasn't already happened, which I don't think it has, but mm, I'd love to find out if it did, um, it's gonna sit here and just look pretty. Until I decide to try to just, like force my way through it, which probably isn't going to work. But anyways, um, so Saturday, Saturday, a little bit later in the week, um, things got more intense because I got one of my most sought after Saturn games, if not the most sought after. Now, um, I had picked up Panzer Dragoon Saga in between like pickup videos. You know, I don't do videos for every pickup I get. It would just be kind of annoying. I would do it when I have like a big crap ton of stuff. I already, actually, that's why I threw Kyle into that update video because it was like, I'm making a video for Kyle. But, um, I was worried it's gonna be too scratched. I managed to talk him down a little bit because it was kind of scratched up and I wasn't gonna be able to test it until I got home. But, uh, ever since John Tron did a video on the Hercules games, I have been dying to own a copy of Herc's Adventure for the Sega Saturn. Um, after being told it's basically Zombies Ate My Neighbors, but like an almost like an open world kind of game. Um, and it was made by LucasArts and the same team. You know, a lot of the guys who worked on Zombies Ate My Neighbors worked on this. And it seems to be as good as they say it is, and uh, it does work. And this is not not an easy game to find complete ever. Um, and I paid decently under what I probably would have paid otherwise. And uh, yeah, I'm just fucking happy. This is the, if you like Zombies Ate My Neighbors or you like quirky like Lucas Arts games that you may not have heard of, like please, 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 please uh, check out the PlayStation One version if you don't care about system. Uh, PlayStation version is about. PlayStation 1 versions about half the price of a Saturn version so you know if need be you got that now the other Saturn game I got on Saturday um, ties in with my girlfriend's like huge huge deal um, she has been dying to get her old Persona games back which she finally got for like super good price she was really paranoid these weren't gonna work and they ended up working um, and she also got Tampa 2 which Tampa 2 is awesome um, not as good as Tumble 1, in my opinion. I like the 2D game better, but... Um, so she got all three of these at a really good price. Like, I mean, she paid, like, way less than probably should. But, uh, she also picked me up for a decent price. Brain Dead 13 for the Sega Saturn, which is another game that I'm not... Not as Herx Adventure big, but I do want, because I'm a big point-and-click, like, fan... Well, it's not point-and-click. I'm a big... I like... FMV games, weirdly enough, and I always thought this one looked cool. I'd always kind of heard about it from the, like, talk, and I remember playing the demo on a PC as a kid, but I never actually got to play it, and, uh, it is very, very Looney Tunes, but very, very violent, but also very weirdly funny, and it's cute, and it's charming, and it has unlimited lives, which I like, because Dragon's Lair is balls hard, and I'm bad at it on Sega CD, so I'm very graceful for that, but, um... 
yeah, this one's kind of hard to come by, but it's not super expensive, but I was happy to get Brain Dead 13. Like, I, I've always wanted to have this game again, and it was nice to get. Um, she also picked up that same day uh, for a really good price from somebody who I would end up getting something big from on Sunday, the entire Spyro trilogy for, like... 40 bucks, which at this point is a super, super good price. Um, shocking to say, I've never actually really played a Spyro game, even though I like ride the Ratchet and Clank games really hard, which is mostly due to the fact that I didn't have a PlayStation 1 until late in, and by the time I got it, I PlayStation 2 was almost here, and I got a PlayStation 2 the next year. It just never happened, and I've always been meaning to, so that kind of works to my benefit at the same time. But finally, on Saturday, um, one booth had a game that I have always wanted to have, but was like kind of just like never looked, seeking it out. Um, that's Mad Gear. Um, Mad Gear, I bought something from every year. I go to any Magfest or too many games. They always have like one or two things that I'm like dying for. I saw where my Sagata Sanchiro Saturn game. That's where I got my copy of Virtual Hydlides. I got my copy of Pitfall 32X for really good price. Um, I've had nothing but great experiences with them, and that happened yet again. Um, but firstly, I got Musashi Noken, which is another Famicom game that belongs to the Game Center CX collection. It's not that great of a game, but it was a, you know, basically if it's under 10 bucks, usually I'm willing to buy Famicom games loose. If not, I'm just going to keep looking online for complete ones, but I figure with this collection, I'm just going to be okay with loose. But more importantly is this. If you're a fan of Broken Pixels, a very old show from 1UP with Shane, Sean, Baby, and Crispin, um, or you're a fan of weird Japanese games, you would know this as Choa Nikki. But this is not a normal shoot em up Choa Nikki, this is the Choa Nikki fighting game. And it's amazing. And I'm not even saying that like it's just like weird amazing, it's actually pretty fun as like a button mashy like dumb fighting game. But I really just want you to see this incredible cover art. And it's just two bald floating heads and the word delicious. I think that speaks volumes. Actually, let me let me do one more thing here. Um, there's that right there. Choneki. What, what the hell else do you expect from Choneki? Um, I I've been dying to have a copy of this game, and it may not belong to any collection. It may not be a Sega game. I don't care. This needed to happen. And I please beg of you to go just online right now. Stop the video, pause it, go to open a new tab. Just look up Broken Pixels and just type in Choaniki. Find it, watch it. You'll understand. You'll totally understand. Um, finally, Sunday came along and uh, random games popped up. Uh, first, this is Shark Shark. I still don't know why the hell April loves Shark Shark so much. But she bought this again just so she'd get the box. She has everything else, just not the box. That's how much she loves Shark Shark. So she now has a complete box Shark Shark with inserts. Maybe someday I'll actually get to play Shark Shark and realize it. Maybe one of you on here can tell me why I care about Shark Shark. Please, by all means, tell me why I should care about Shark Shark. But she got that. She also got... This is, this is actually a really cool item. I've only ever seen this once, but never with this envelope. Which is the copy of Dragon Warrior, but with the Nintendo Power, like, letter pack and stuff. So, like, there's a time where if you subscribe to Nintendo Power for, like, a month or two, you would get Dragon Warrior 1 and a whole bunch of press material. And, like, so if you open up the envelope, like, there's somebody sticking this on so it won't get lost, but it's, like, tips on how to start the game. And if you get in the envelope, like, you got, like, a letter from, like, Square Enix. Um, it's even addressed to the descendants of Edr Ar Ar Ardric? Ardric? Um, there's also, like, a letter from Nintendo Power, but it's not in here, weirdly enough. Um, this is when I'm promoting Dragon Warrior 2, so, like, there's a uh, Dragon Warrior 2, like, big giant map. And then, of course, this has, like, an adventurer card and, like, another map inside of it for Dragon Warrior 1 and a whole bunch of crap. And it, it's super, super cool. And they, there's not a lot of them with, like, all of the material still left in them. So, like, finding that was, like, a holy grail for her because, again, she is an obsessive Dragon Quest collector. Um, oh, this, I also got this during Herc's Adventure. This is to help bargain down my price on the game. This is a, uh, called Legends for Dreamcast, which is one of my favorite multiplayer games. I have lots of memories of playing this on the Dreamcast with friends when I was in, like, 6th, 7th grade. So, that was important to get. But anyways, I almost forgot about it. Um, another holy grail, thanks to my friend Nate and the Sprite Lovers and April for finding it, um, 
the Dreamcast game that I have been gunning for the most. Um, weirdly enough, when I was out in Las Vegas, I actually found the biggest of the Dreamcast game, which is GigaWing 2 for $75 complete, which is pretty good, all things considered. But uh, more importantly, the real expensive game that I'm looking for isn't Cannon Spike, although I do want that at some point. But my favorite weird game, and probably the next episode of Hit Reset, Illbleed. The weirdest survival horror game ever made, and also a game that I love because it's based in the theme park. I have an obsession with theme parks and coasters and stuff. And while this is not traditional theme park, it's like all haunted housey stuff, the setting still works for me. The voice acting is horrible. The gameplay is weird and very, like, odd, and it doesn't work, and it's janky, and, like, it, the concept is odd, and it has really weird fan service -y stuff that happens if you beat the game once, and odd secrets, and I... It is, and... It is a very decisive game. If you ask somebody about this game, they either tell you it's garbage or it's like an absolute lost classic that is just underappreciated in the ends of the world and I clearly fall into the second camp. Um, but I've been dying to. This is the, re the reason there hasn't been an episode of Hit Reset about this because I didn't own it. Now I do. It's coming. It's happening. <laughs> Um, but in the Sega CD front, I finally have the most expensive of the four games I had left, which, I mean, let me speak volumes to how close I am to this thing. I got a copy of Nova Storm complete. It's okay. It has good psychosis uh, sci psychosis music. I can pronounce words. Um, it's a game with FMV backgrounds with, like, three ships that move around so to basically like, go into the depth shooter and it's... It's very bland and mediocre, but it's hard to come by complete, so I can't complain. So I'm really I'm three games away. Starblade, Mad Dog 2, BC Racers, and I'll be done with Sega CD. All the complete collection. I'm very excited. Uh, but finally, I had some weird finds. So right near the end of the convention, this guy had a bin of Famicom games, and they were all a buck. And most of them I didn't need, but I did find Oshinobo! Which is, of course, part of the Game Center CX collection, and it even has an owner's name on it. I can't read Japanese, but cool. Um, it's a weird point-click game about making perfect recipes of food, and it's weird. And I'm never going to be able to actually play the game, but I've watched Reno play it, so theoretically I can really BS my way through it. But, uh, yeah, cool to have another game in that for so cheap. You can never go wrong with dollar games that are imports, but I have no idea whose booth that was, so I can't help. Um, but the last thing I did was the uh, the Philly Retro Gaming Group Society. Uh, and I'm gonna forget their full name. Their link will be here. You can look it up. Uh, it's basically a group of Philly who just gets together once a month, and has a meet up, and plays video games, and like you know, basically is a social club, which I think is kind of cool. I mean, it's a good way for people to get out and meet other people, and you know, not have to go to a convention to do it, and maybe keep it a little more local. You know, you know, people you're gonna meet are probably gonna be people you can see a lot. So they were selling some stuff to support buying more things for their, you know, personal selves and also for, like, the group. For, you know, purpose of bringing the meetups. Uh, I bought two Saturn games. Um, one is Loaded, which is a game I've always kind of wanted. I've always heard, like, a lot of people are nostalgic for this game, but nobody ever says it's like, yeah, it's aged really well. They mostly go like, eh, it hasn't aged great, but like at the time it was super cool. It's very edgy, like it's a top-down 2D shooter with lots of blood everywhere and you're killing everybody. It's very, like... Feels like playing Binding of Isaac, or like playing like um, a Top Town Doom, or like Smash TV kind of thing. It it has its fun. It's weird. It's very 90s. Very like Seth Mc or not Seth MacFarlane. Oh my God, Todd MacFarlane. Jesus Christ, that would have been any weird. I'm um, very like kind of like that. It, it kind of reminds me of Evil Prophecy, except it's better than Evil Prophecy, and this came out like way before Evil Prophecy. Um, but I also got, which I found it is a very rare game to find complete in box, even though it's not that expensive, Courier Crisis, which is literally a bike-based game of Crazy Taxi. I mean, it's like, it's uncanny. It's like, you grab, you, you like, bike up to people, grab like an envelope or a package and go and deliver it to a place. And you're based on time, and that's how much, like, points you get. And it has like a punk, like, pop-punk soundtrack to it, and it's like... Okay, so maybe Sega didn't come up with the concept of Crazy Taxi as originally as they thought they did. But uh, it's actually pretty fun. It, it's a little maybe more crass than I care for it to be. The humor kind of like gets a little too toilety and fratty for my taste sometimes. But uh, gameplays wise, it's fun. So uh, I can't complain. You know, basically it's 
do better runs, get better bikes, get better parts, get to do more levels, bigger levels, you know, harder levels, lots of missions. Um, it's it's a fun game. If you can find it for cheap, you should pick it up. I think it's on PS1 too, and I'm pretty sure the PS1 copy is like super cheap. So, unless you're like a collector of Saturn, I would suggest it. But finally, the weird last one. So April, April wants to get like one of every console. And I'm not against that. I actually do wouldn't mind having one. I'm really gunning for Turbo Graphics. That didn't happen this time. We got the one that I don't really want to have in the house that I have no interest in. But I paid 80 bucks, so I paid like pretty good. Or I paid like uh, 100 it was, it was somewhere. I paid I paid I paid a good amount, like a very fair deal, for a uh, a system that uh, really needs no introduction. The Virtual Boy. She wants one. Probably because she's an Atlas fan and Persona fan and she wants Jack Bros, but also because she just likes having all these weird systems. Uh, the cool part about this was, um, so it came with the battery pack and like nice shape and a nice controller. Um, but it also came with, uh, the manual, which, you know, that's kind of cool to have. It didn't come in the box. If it came in the box, I'd be super excited, but, uh, getting the manual is nice. Um, but it also came with not Mario Tennis, but actually probably the second best to Wario Land uh, game on the system, which is Tellero Boxer, um, which is basically a spin off y version of Punch Out. And uh, probably, I, I would say, the best built game, like, it took advantage of the system the best. I think Wario Land is a better game, but this one took advantage of every part of what should have made the Virtual Boy unique. Um, it was first person, so it felt like you were actually in virtual reality to some degree. If the screen was a little bit closer to your face, it would have really worked better. Um, it took advantage of the game's two directional pads by allowing you to control each arm with a directional. So you would, you know, push up on this to do a uh, left block, this would do your right block, and then you have your shoulder buttons to punch. It was very satisfying, so you kind of did get absorbed into the game, and, um, it's kind of a shame that the, uh, the game never really kind of got stuck on a, you know, system that ended up failing. Like, I mean, like, if more games were like this, it might have had a fighting chance. I still think it would have bombed, but I think this is the kind of game that should have been on the system. And unfortunately, it just wasn't there. But, uh, it, it you know, I, I'm not going to complain about getting the one of the two games I actually want for the system. And that was literally, like, at the buzzer beater. Like, I mean, they were right next door to our 8-bit evolution booth, so we grabbed that. So that was... Too many games in a nutshell. Lots of, uh, just all kinds of weird stuff got bought there, and the convention was an absolute blast, and, uh, I'm dead tired from it, but, um, I get a little bit of reprieve from cons for a little bit, so I'm gonna be working tirelessly, hopefully, on videos from here on out, but, uh, I'm glad to finally be able to do one of these videos and be like, there's a new video here, and, uh, hopefully, hopefully, unless the world crumbles, it won't be too long between this and, uh, part two of the Sega CD Sports, and maybe more? No? But, uh, thanks for watching. As always, I appreciate it. Um, again, um, you should check out Sprite Lovers, Mr. Sintastic, the, you know, old friends from home. You should check out On the Stick and Joe. You should check out Eric and Game vs. Game. Um, all of the retro shops that I actually can remember that I got stuff from, all that's gonna be listed down there. They're all people that I'm, like, worked with before, I've seen them at a lot of other conventions, and they're totally worth checking out if you ever see them at another convention, if they're local, what have you, should do it up, and uh, thanks for watching everybody, and I will see you guys real soon.